Okay, so dear guests, welcome to the violence in postcolonial fiction session. Uh, in this session, we'll have two presenters, Hedia Özkan and Zafer Ayar. Uh, I'd like to start with Hedia Özkan. Let me first introduce her to you. Uh, Hedia Uskan is teaching in the Department of English Language and Literatures at Aksara University. Her areas of expertise are 19th century British and American literature, life writing, women writers, activism, and intersectional theory. She's an associate editor of Watching Review and currently working on an edited book project on marginalized women and work in British and American culture, American literature and media. Hedia Ojang. Floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, to the organizers, and I'm sorry that I have to connect with my phone instead of my laptop. Uh, technical problems always happens, and uh, I don't know, you can't control things sometimes. So the uh, title of my presentation is Epistemic Violence and Things Fall Apart. I'm going to read uh, my presentation. Um, European colonialism in the 19th and 20th centuries went beyond the economic interest of the colonizers with social institutions prevailed native culture, language, and religion in Africa. Therefore, the African countries not only became a source of new materials, but also the victim of colonial epistemology fulfilled through systematic religious, linguistic, linguistic and educational impositions employed as integral colonial apparatus. One of the critical literary representations of such epistemic violence is Chinua Achabi's Things Fall Apart, portraying the struggle of Umuofia people to maintain the cultural integrity against colonialism. The dominant colonial policies of the British in Nigeria that undoubtedly serves for the eradication of indigenous knowledge and culture are thoroughly depicted, not only through physical violence to the captured native bodies but, uh, and lands, but also epistemic violence to the voices, minds, and intellects. Perpetuated through colonial institutions like church, school, and court, such violence accelerates the communal and spiritual downfall of the society, while implicitly justifying the colonial presence and domination in Africa. While the Christian missionaries take the control of native people's spiritual and intellectual life, the British administrators and traders rule the economy and socio-political matters in the village, whose transformation to a colonial base begins with colonial education in the church and continues expanding to culture, language, nature, religion, economy, and politics. The imposed Western colonial epistemology in the narrative as a form of intellectual violence is considered superior to indigenous epistemology eradicated with a set of colonial practices. Discussing the intricate relationship between knowledge and power, along with epistemic violence, a term coined by Gayatri Spivak, this paper examines how epistemic violence is carried out for colonial purposes in the narrative and the role of colonial institutions as places disrupting the integrity and solidarity of the native community. Spivak defines the epistemic violence as, quote, the remotely orchestrated, far-flung, and heterogeneous project to constitute the colonial subject as other, end of quote, within colonial past and imperial present. This project, she continues, quote, is also the asymmetrical obliteration of the trace of the other in its precarious subjectivity. End code. This subject, this project is used in the process of othering and based on classifications and hierarchies where the subaltern is silenced by both colonial and indigenous patriarchal structures. For Foucault, uh, such violence is privileging some knowledges while subjugating certain others. According to Claudia Brunner, knowledge is quote, linked to the neutralization and legitimization of both visible and invisible in multiple forms of violence, end quote. Within colonial and imperial experience, epistemic violence is connected to Eurocentrism 
which is centrality of Western agency, religious and educational civilizing missions involve violence to enforce colonial control, which penetrated into institutions and society. It was one of the various forms of eradication of indigenous culture and the suppression and domination of colonial subjects through knowledge systems by Eurocentric and Western ideologies. Uh, when we look at the narrative, the, per the first part portrays how Igbo society, which has impressive civil, ritual, and religious orders between the phenomenal and supernatural worlds, while the following chapters depict how it is subjected to both physical and epistemic violence. In the second year of his exile, one of Konkos, the protagonist, the protagonist of the book, and most people define him as a tragic hero. Uh, one of Okonko's friends mentions a white man who appears in Okonko's old village and explains how other white men came to the market and kill everyone as a revenge for their friend, white man, who uh, is murdered by villagers. The first encounter of Western and indigenous people leads to physical violence, which forces the villagers to involuntarily accept the presence of the village white strangers in their land. Besides the physical violence, the dissolution, the dissolution of the society accelerates when the missionaries convert people, establish a church, and eventually set up a court. As Walter Rodney remarks, missionaries are Quote, agents of colonialism in the practical sentence, and each mission station are, is an exercise in colonization. End quote. Furthermore, the church as a source of education was probably more attractive to many converts than the church as a dispenser of religion. But actually, the church as a dispenser of religion was more at attractive to the people in um, Igbo society in the narrative. The missionaries came to Muofia in the second year of Okonko's exile, build a church, convert people, send them as evangelists to the surrounding villages and towns. The first converts are those who have no status and title. They are called ifulifu, worthless, empty men. And missionaries win some other converts in the following weeks. These people are either excluded by social institutions have a disagreement with cultural values or are personally harmed by the traditional family system. This missionary, the missionaries present an alternative way to those who are excluded by their kinsmen. The outcasts, um, quote, seeing the new religion welcomed to winds and such abominations, though that it was possible that they would also be received, end quote. This is from the book. They are given status by missionaries and charged to spread the new faith to others. Through colonial institutions, Gail Kelly and Philip Albeck claims, quote, individuals without much status in indigenous society could gain status, social mobility, and advancement, end quote. While Bonnie Freeman states that they, quote, identify themselves with their aggressor to assume his superiority and knowledge to depend on the colonizer for the definition um, of the situation, protection, and other resources." End of quote. The new religion offers a standable sense of belonging and acceptance to some in the village by unacknowledging their beliefs. For example, Okonko's son, Nooyi, finds the clan laws intolerable uh, and eventually joins missionaries to seek belonging and acceptance. Nooyi is criticized by his father for not being as strong and ambitious as himself, and he suffers from an inner conflict as a result of his brother's death. It was not his biological brother, but the, the, the kid Okonko brought from another village uh, in return for a um, murder. On the day of missionaries, visit, he was captured by the poetry of the new religion. They talk about the new God, the creator of all the world, all the men and women. The white man, a quote, told them that they worship false gods, gods of wood and stone. 
This is how they unacknowledge their belief system, the villagers' belief system. The local and provincial knowledge is dismissed by the white man who continues, quote, all the gods you have named are not gods at all. They are gods of deceit who tell you to kill your fellows and destroy innocent children, end of quote. As Sophia Samatar argues, quote, the structure is their spiritual world scrambles in the face of radically different ideology, end of quote. However, discontent, discontent people like Nawoyi are emotionally captured when they burst into a song which tells the song is about uh, of brothers who lived in darkness and fear, ignored of the love of God, seems to answer a vague and persistent question that haunted uh, his young soul, the question of the twins crying in the bush and the question of Ikime Funa, who was killed. So Norway finds um, new, new things or resilience in the new religion. The missionary's first lesson wins his heart, uh, Norway's heart, who is the victim uh, he is the victim of Okonko's oppressive hypermasculinity. Embracing the new culture and alienating himself from the old, Nawoyi decides to attend missionary school where young Christians are taught to read and write. And he became, uh, becomes a teacher there, an ardent, ardent supporter of the new faith. For missionaries, religious motivations were the key element in establishing schools. Most colonial schools emphasize two things, language instruction, and moral education. These two things are applied by Mr. Brown in the text, The White Missionary in Narrative. He built a school in, uh, and a little hospital. He visits the families and asks them to send their children to the school by assuring them that the leaders of the land in the future would be men and women who had learned to read and write. His school produced quick results in a few, few months. It were enough to make one a court messenger or even a court clerk. Those who stayed longer became teachers. Um, new churches were established in the surrounding villages and a few school with them. Uh, from the very beginning, religion and education went in hand, went hand in hand. These schools were primarily designated to serve the needs of colonizers who were concerned with training literate clerks who could stop the lower ranks of the civil service. Achabi's depictions about the stages in which missionaries take are prominent around assimilating communities through a set of rules in disguise of education and religious instructions. Missionaries not only build a church in the evil forest, which shows how, they influence, uh, influence, how their influence expands to nature, but they also build a place for judgment uh, to, protect the to protect the followers of the religion. It means they do not bring religion, but also government with a court where the district, district commissioner judges the cases in ignorance. They put those who had offended against the white man's law into the prison. The purpose is to legitimize an alien domination of Africans by establishing a court, colonial power, that has already ruled the social life starts to dominate and subjugate the politics of the clan. Um, but we know that the colonizers didn't bring, bring education in Africa. Africans has already an education system intermingles with daily life, social, society, culture, nature, before colonizers infused a set of um, instructions. We know in African culture, education has a close relationship with social life, culture, and associated is associated with spiritual and intellectualist senses. It is formed around protective activities in tribal communities, and nature is one of the first teachers of younger generations for their physical, emotional, and mental development. It promotes the use of materials and sources in harmony with the environment. Um, the informal nature of this education system in pre-colonial Africa truly match the realities of pre-colonial African society and produced well-rounded personalities to fit in that society. But when colonizers came, they eliminated the existing uh, education system pertaining to Africans and replaced it with a new set of formal instructions. Um, 
as a conclusion, epistemic violence in relation to colonial domination threatens the integrity of the community and things fall apart in marginalization of certain subjects for the interests of others. Um, Igbo society was unaware of their colonization and substantial transformation until too late due to both visible and invisible form of epistemic violence. Okonko's desire of violence, war, and bloodshed was defeated by the epistemic violence of the white strangers. Uh, as opposed to ethnographic projects, project of district commissioner, you may remember the last sentence of the book, uh, who had already chosen the title of the book after much thought, the pacification of the primitive tribes of the lower Niger, which ironically indicates the colonial misinterpretation of Africa. Achabi rewrites history against the Eurocentric denial of African identity and heritage, um, combating the antagonistic and myopic Western weave of African realities Things Fall Apart stands as a resistance to epistemic violence and dissemination of the image of Africa. Achabe counters colonial silencing and Eurocentric narcissism by portraying African historical and cultural reality in the narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Emil Ojam. Sorry, Hedi Ojam. Uh, our next speaker is Zafar Ayar. Uh, I'll read his biography first. Zafar Ayar received his BA degree from Atatürk University. He took a position as an English lecturer at Caracas Technical University in 1201. Uh, sorry, 2001. He obtained his MA degree from Chankai University from the Department of English Language and Literature in 2013. He completed his PhD and got his doctoral degree from the Department of English Language and Literature at Karabakh University. And his speech entitled today is The Impact of Cultural Violence on Cultural Identity in Naples, Half a Life. Safira Jan. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And by the way, I'd like to thank Edi Ojam as well for her presentation. Um, I think we have enough time ahead. Uh, yeah, we have. Okay. Uh, and I have difficulty in, you know, adjusting the time and like, catching up with the, 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 the time limited, I mean. <laughs> if that happens, uh, Okay, and I, could I'll... you please give me uh, a kind of warning and if I, you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll do that. Get over uh, the time allocated for me. Uh, okay. Okay, let me uh, share the screen first and then I'm going to start. Okay, uh, the topic is the impact of cultural violence on cultural identity uh, in VS Naples uh, Half a Life. Um, maybe it's, uh, it's, you know, it, uh, very classical to make the definition of um, you know, violence um, that is, you know, explained in a dictionary. And everybody knows what is violence, but today, of course, I'm going to go a little bit further than the, the definition of violence. Um, I'm going to touch upon um, the functional uh, cultural violence uh, in an attempt to, you know, support or um, form the basis or uh, infrastructure for direct violence and structural violence. That's why uh, I'm going to uh, give a brief information about uh, Johann Galtung's, uh, you know, uh, claim about what is violence in connection with that, that definition of violence. I'm going to give uh, a little bit information about um, the types of violences. Okay. Uh, Galton says, however, cultural violence highlights the way in which the act of direct violence and the fact of structural violence are legitimized and thus rendered acceptable in society. Okay, we have three kinds of 
Uh, and this is, of course, Galton's uh, tripartite uh, definition of violence. And with this triangle, uh, he gives, uh, you know, very specific uh, connections about direct violence and structural violence and the cultural violence. Okay, at the top of this triangle, and we can see direct violence that is connected with the visible kind of uh, violence. And we have structural violence on the left bottom and uh, on the right bottom, we have cultural violence. Okay, the direct violence is uh, visible and the structural and cultural violence uh, are invisible. Okay, when it comes to uh, direct violence, and the visible uh, kind of violence uh, include, includes all types of war, and such as nuclear and civil war, and domestic violence, you know, uh, the violence in the family, in the society, uh, and drug abuse, suicides, human rights abuse, and violent crimes. And structural violence, and Galton considers uh, that kind of violence as invisible and all types of inequalities, um, poverty, hunger, and prejudice, cultural domination, racism, sexism, religious intolerance, alienation, low self-esteem. Okay, the question comes into mind that, and when we look at uh, you know, um, the content of structural uh, violence, and uh, we can uh, think that, and the poverty, we can see poverty in the hunger, and we can see hunger and prejudice, maybe cultural domination, racism, sexism, so on and so forth. But here, uh, okay, they, they might be uh, visible, but these are not uh, the physical uh, violence, just like direct violence. That's why uh, Galting says um, the content of structural violence is invisible. Then comes um, cultural violence okay, that I'm going to uh, touch upon in connection with structural violence and the direct violence. Mm, type show cultural violence is religion, and he divides uh, this type of violence and cultural violence into uh, different categories. And you know, the cultural violence is a little bit different from um, other types of. Uh, cultures like structural uh, structural uh, violence and the direct violence. And in this violence, and we have religion, and we have ideology, we have art, we have language, we have empirical science and formal uh, science. Okay. If we return back to this uh, tripartite, by Galton and the place of cultural violence. And uh, both types of violence, I mean, cultural violence and structural violence um, supports direct violence, okay? And um, just like the clockwise and the cultural violence um, supports structural violence and then it supports direct violence and both of them individually, uh, you know, supports uh, direct violence. And the cultural violence acts, I'm going to explain the details. Okay, and violence is predominantly pervasive in the colonized nations that have been oppressed by the Western countries in the initiative to impose social, cultural, and religious values. Despite all kinds of objections and reactions of the third world people 
exposition to different types of violence has been inevitable for the people living in these countries. Whether direct or structural forms, and as well as in the cultural form, violence has considerably been the core issue in the writings of colonial and post-colonial periods, respectively. Okay, um, when we consider, um, you know, the political, the social, uh, the cultural, maybe the literary uh, developments um, during the colonial and post-colonial uh, periods, um, violence, whether national or international, plays a crucial role in the formation of colonial societies under the influence of Western domination in a variety of ways, ranging from to military interference, okay, and this was uh, the you know primary uh, you know weapon of colonial regimes, enslavement and displacement, and both are you know were uh, together. Why? Because if uh, there is a kind of enslavement and and the transportation of those uh, slavers to other uh, you know. Uh, places of the world. So there appeared a kind of displacement. And um, all these interference, all kinds of interference, you know, resulted in cultural corruption. And again, in terms of uh, religious activities, and there appeared missionary activities and exploitation of the land and exploitation. Um, of the you know wealth of those uh, nations and imposition of the Western superiority and Oriental inferiority and by using what by using uh, what uh, Ediojan uh, explained uh, the power of knowledge okay the power of um, knowledge okay Fanon. In his uh, very famous book, The Wretched of the Earth, uh, elaborated the dynamics of violence and the human drama that unfolds in situations of oppression. He boldly analyzed violence in its structural, institutional, and personal dimensions. Okay, when uh, we look at direct and structural uh, violence, and the, these two types, and uh, we can see uh, all uh, these, you know, uh, oppressions. So, uh, in its structural, institutional, and personal forms. And he brought fresh insights to a central topic of human history, albeit a topic that, it, that is difficult to unravel or study. And Brian and Tiffin argue that. Uh, cultural imposition took place on the home ground of the colonized people, and the lines between colonized and the colonizer were clearly drawn. Okay, uh, this, you know, uh, the lines between the colonized and the colonizer were clearly drawn uh, owing to the military interference, owing to, uh, you know, different kinds of displacement. Um, and the missionary activities and using, you know, some educational institutions. Um, so uh, when uh, we look at the situation in South Africa, the situation is a little bit, uh, you know, different. And there was a kind of structural violence in, uh, in, in its racist term uh, that is called apartheid. And uh, along this uh, period, the lines between the white and the black people were clearly drawn. Okay, so uh, uh, the rights of black people, um, you know, were taken away by the white colonizer. Okay, generally, and this. 
uh, of course, uh, you know, clarifies the function of cultural uh, violence uh, and how it works to, um, you know, support structural and direct violence. And a, a casual flow from cultural via structural to direct violence can be identified. The culture preaches, teaches, admonishes, acts on and does on into seeing exploitation and or repression as normal and natural. And with the cultural norms, um, you know, with the cravings of uh, culture, uh, we and the people in especially the, the colonized nations um, start to, uh, you know, make out the developments as normal and natural or into not seeing them, particularly not exploitation at all, okay? And we, we consider uh, what is happening or what has been happening uh, in those uh, countries as normal and natural. Then come to the eruption, the efforts to use direct violence to get out of the structural iron cage. And then that means and the direct violence the physical violence and the visible violence starts and counter violence to keep the cage intact. Okay, when it comes to uh, where's Naipaul? Naipaul is, uh, you know, one of the uh, prolific writers of the post-colonial uh, period. And uh, he, you know, uh, appeared on the uh, stage uh, of literature as a writer, uh, both in the short story and you know, novellas and the novels, uh, uh, which are uh, fictional and non-fictional. And V.S. Naipaul, um, his perspective has been shaped by the humiliation of his youth, because what we see in his um, you know, semi-autobiographical novels. Uh, he talks about his life in Trinidad and his familial life and, and ancestral uh, life in back in India. And it is also influenced by his consciousness of being Indian and the humiliations India and Indians suffered. He writes often about the conditions of India and the Indian diaspora of which, and of course, he is a part. And as a writer, um, and you know, he was on the side of, uh, he's, he appeared to be on the side of British culture. And he was, um, again, scornful of formerly colonized societies. And he is the central to any discussions of assimilation and duality or post-colonial identity. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, Naipaul's uh, and one of Naipaul's latest uh, novels, uh, Half a Life. And of course, there are several uh, quotations uh, that are supposed to be taken uh, and or, or due to you know the um, the richness of uh, different lifestyles and different you know occurrences and the different uh, events uh, taking place throughout the novel. Uh, but I uh, you know we have a limited time, uh, so we have to you know keep up with the time uh, allotted for us. Uh, I have to choose a few uh, for you just to explain uh, what is behind the scene uh, in terms of uh, cultural violence and in connection with uh, the other types of structural and the direct uh, violence. Okay, our protagonist is Billy and this is the prequel to the second novel. Uh, magic seeds, and so we have a common, um, you know, protagonist, uh, 
um, Willis Somerset, Chandram uh, in Half a Life is in pursuit of discovering and uh, since he starts questioning his existence in India, London, and Africa. He himself is in a constant search for his identity by experiencing unholiness and the sense of belonging due to his ambivalent dislocation between India, London, and an unnamed country in Africa. His ruthlessness and attempt to find a fixed place and identity force, uh, identity force feeling into a complex situation as he tries to reach a resolution in terms of finding a home, fixed identity, and a sense of belonging. Whatever, uh, sorry, wherever Willard travels, he finds, he feels as if he is in a psychological exile as a result of a recurrent sense of unholiness and his feeling of not belonging anywhere. Uh, yes, um, our protagonist, Willie, and the first, you know, uh, you know, shapes his plans you know, uh, around his uh, ancestral roots and his familial background and uh, his own country, India. Uh, so he turns his back, uh, first his family and then his society and then to his country. And uh, he planned to leave the country to go to London, maybe because of the, uh, you know, cultural impos imposition uh, along with the structural and the direct uh, violences, respectively. Okay, William was born, and uh, this is, you know, uh, will be a quote, Billy was born into a sort of uprooted family, uprooted from the social norms and cultural values, which leads Billy into a half life. Okay. And this is the, the title of the book. And the story his father tells him widens the psychological gap in Billy's mind. Okay, the story is uh, told by his father uh, about the caste system. And um, you know, they, were, they, uh, they had been raised in uh, both uh, Willie's uh, father and his mother and belonged to different uh, castes. But uh, although it was forbidden, uh, you know, to get married with someone from different castes, uh, Willie's father uh, got married uh, his mother uh, from a lower caste. So this became a, a big problem. And also, you know, it is a, a religious case that took place you know, uh, within the society, um, uh, which can be also connected to cultural violence. All my anxiety, quote, by the way, when Little Villa was born, was to see how much of the backward could be read in his features. So this is, uh, you see in features and he is black and he is of Indian background and he is of, you know, uh, the subjugated class and so on and so forth. And Mr. Chandran is very aware that his son was born into a backward caste with a low social status. And this uh, is the, the social status and is related to, again, um, the structural violence, but uh, this is acceptable in the society, okay? And, and if, you, uh, if you were born into a backward caste uh, uh, and with a low social status, okay, that is, uh, that means you are uh, a lower, uh, you know, uh, social class within the society. So, in culturally, that is acceptable. So, the cultural violence, you know, supports um, the doctrines, supports the, um, you know, uh, application. So, um, structural violence again. Okay, Billy Chandran makes up his own mind because. He felt betrayed by his father 
and discussed and responds back accordingly. The moment his dad finishes his background story, Billy's estrangement towards his family grows bigger and bigger and says, what is there, in quote, but what is there for me in what we have said? You offer me nothing. Okay, uh, so um, Billy uh, comes to an understanding that his familial background and his estrangement towards his, uh, you know, ancestral background and grow, grows bigger and bigger. And then and, uh, he decides to go to London uh, to become, uh, you know, uh, a promising writer, like uh, Somerset Vaughan. Okay. He knew that London was a great city. His idea of a great city was for a favorite land of splendor and dazzle. And when he got to London and began walking about the street, he felt let down, unquote. And here, uh, okay, he, he leaves the country, okay, and uh, he, he does not complete uh, his education at mission school, uh, just like uh, uh, her, and his uh, sister Sarayini uh, did, uh, he moves to London. And the only two places he knew about the city were Buckingham Palace and the Shakespeare's corner. He was disappointed by Buckingham, Buckingham Palace. He thought that the Maharaja's palace in his own state was grander and more like a palace. His disappointment turned to something like shame at himself for his gullibility when he went to uh, speaker's corner. Okay, here uh, again, uh, you know, when he was in, in his uh, country uh, back in India, uh, you know, the imposition by the, the, the colonizers ideology, uh, created a kind of, you know, uh, metropolitan in Willie's mind that is not, you know, uh, matches with what he sees when he goes to uh, London. So, again, uh, such kind of, you know, direct or structural violence uh, does not, uh, you know, matches with his uh, cultural uh, background. Okay, Willis' uneasiness in the West can be taken into consideration as a motivation in his search for a secure place and find out his major cultural, national, and personal identity. Upon Percy's departure, one of his best friends is a consequence of racial wars and killings that Percy regarded as a menace. Willis thought Humiliation like this awaits me here. I must follow Percy. I must leave. Okay, I'm going to uh, give a little bit, uh, you know, detailed, uh, elaborate information about uh, this event uh, in uh, parts of London at that time. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the riot, the racial riots and the killings uh, in, in, in England that Willie himself uh, witnessed uh, was part of the direct uh, and, and structural uh, violence because it was, uh, you know, there were direct killings, killings and then uh, the racial issue, uh, especially towards uh, the, the uh, black people living uh, in this country. Uh, that's why um, he, he himself, again, felt humiliated, uh, you know, towards uh, uh, such events uh, there because he was, you know, imagining uh, a different uh, atmosphere away from uh, such kind of violences because, uh, you know, his cultural uh, 
part of the empire, the colonizer, you know, um, filled in with, uh, you know, good imagination, uh, you know, good description of London. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he is again uh, felt disappointed when he witnessed such events in England. Okay. When Billy is alone and desperate in a foreign country, he receives a letter from Anna, a Portuguese girl, African girl, who has read one of Billy's stories and felt the need to write and meet him. Quote, I feel I had to write to you because in your stories for the first time, I find moments that are like moments in my own life, though the background and the materials so different. Okay. Uh, and of course, for the first time when Billy, uh, you know, went to London uh, with the, you know, dream of becoming a promising writer and he produced uh, something uh, in an amateur way. So, uh, and some of them were rejected by the editor and then, and later on, uh, he uh, were able to, he was able to publish uh, his stories. But uh, at first sight, again, uh, he is using, you know, his own background to express uh, his own situation. Uh, that is, you know, very uh, familiar, familiar to Anna from an African country. And then he's going to leave London uh, with the expectation of uh, getting married with Anna. Okay, uh, again, uh, the, the, the reels uh, continues in this part. And that weekend, the race riots began in Nothing Hill, and the silent streets with exposed rubbish bins, dealt with uh, house and the flat numbers, and with windows heavily uh, curtained and screened and blank, became full of excited people. The houses that had seemed tenanted and, and only by the very old and passive now led out in a number of young men in mock advertising clothes who roam the streets looking for blacks. Okay, this, uh, this racial riot, uh, again, uh, you know, was uh, against the, uh, the black people and the West Indian called Kelso with no idea what was happening, coming to visit friends, walked into a teenage crowd outside Latimer Road underground, underground station and was killed. So, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, Naipaul witnesses such event and, you know, his cultural uh, violence works as a, you know, uh, justifying or legitima legitimizing, you know, mechanism of the direct uh, violence. So they cannot do anything uh, about such events there, except, you know, filling the country uh, or abandoning the country. Okay, racially, uh, they were very white from uh, what looked like pure uh, white to a deep brown. A number of them were of my father's complexion in Indian and this might have been one reason why they seem to accept me. Uh, okay, here uh, he leaves London and then uh, goes to Portuguese African country with Anna uh, and he marries Anna and he's going to spend uh, their 18 years from now on. And this might have been one reason why seem to accept me. Anna said later, quote, they don't know what to make of you. There were Indians in the country. I wasn't an absolute exotic. 
there were quite a few Indian traders. They can cheap shops, they run cheap shops and socially never step outside their families. Uh, so, uh, and Willis uh, explains here that and he was accepted by the African people because he had uh, lots of questions in mind while going to, uh, before going to Africa, whether he is going to, you know, adapt to the conditions of the third world countries once more or not. So uh, he was really surprised when he was accepted. And so, you know, uh, although he feels very close, uh, uh, you know, culturally, maybe ideologically, uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, his reaction to his own background, uh, he feels very close to the, the lifestyle uh, in London or because of his prejudice. But uh, he is welcomed uh, by the African people when he goes to Africa. Okay, Billy makes up his mind about going to Africa and I'm passing this part. Okay, Billy's determination originates from his uneasiness in England where he has been exposed to discrimination, isolation and alienation. And, and all of these are you know, related to uh, structural uh, violence. Yet Anna's hesitation is mainly based upon the challenging lifestyle, which she thinks really will have difficulty integrating into. Yes, uh, he has the difficulty integrating into the lifestyle in Africa. Um, because you know, uh, you know, he he has some expectations, and uh, he is disappointed what he has in hand, both in uh, England and in Africa. And then he uh, again, 18 years later, he returns back to uh, Germany and then starts a new, uh, you know, uh, adventure. Okay. Okay. His stories um, take place in a vague setting that reflects Billy's feelings, feeling of ambivalent attitudes and his unhomely sensations that has taken over him since his first arrival in the metropolitan. Um, and quote, he began to understand, and this was something they had had to write essays about at the college how Shakespeare had done it and with his borrowed settings and borrowed stories and never with direct tales from his own life and the life around him. And, uh, and of course, Billy's first step about writing was uh, to write about his own uh, story uh, back in uh, India uh, because his exotic, uh, you know, uh, ancestral uh, background, his exotic life in uh, back in India, and you know, his authentic, uh, you know, caste system uh, that was really uh, effective at that time uh, in Indian society. Uh, you know, he found all these elements very attractive for the readers uh, in England. So uh, he, he tried to you know, support his uh, presence uh, in the Metropolitan uh, with his uh, writings, both uh, literally and culturally, uh, we can say. Okay, when we look at the whole story, and of course, there are lots of things, uh, I will try to uh, put some more to the full text, um, if you are interested in, you can read the full text uh, when it is published. Um, as a conclusion, uh, I think, uh, Baruch Hoca, I'm okay with the time, by the way. Um, Hojam, um, this is Mohsin. I, I think Baruch Hoca is having some problems okay. with the computer right now. 
and um, if people have any questions, they no, can no, I, I haven't, I haven't finished yet, uh, Musina Jam. Okay, uh, okay, okay, uh, okay. Just I want to ask. Uh, I'm okay with the time. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm finishing. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, okay. Okay, with the practices of colonial Western ideology, uh, direct violence and the structural violence intended to deconstruct the social structures in third world countries. On the other hand, uh, cultural violence has acted like, uh, sorry, an, an insidious mechanism to suppress the indigenous people and make them see all the ill-treatments, misconceptions and the violence of all sorts of colonizing ideology as normal activities. Uh, okay, th this is my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Okay, uh, if you have any question, uh, I can get and answer the questions willingly. Okay, do you have any question? Okay, uh, dear Bashucha is having problem with the computer. Okay. During the sessions, Tanesh. Yes, any question? To me, uh, Musinojan? Um, I can chair, uh, I can chair if you wish. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but okay. if you, I think he asked you to. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, dear participants, um, if you have any question to me and to Hedie Ojam, you can ask your questions related to uh, the topics that we have uh, presented. Have you got any question to me? No, thanks. Uh, I just want to thank to uh, the participants uh, mm -hmm. and the session chair and the organizers. Thanks mm -hmm. for the opportunity for us to share our research. Okay. Uh, I have uh, a question. Uh, yeah. Kaitia? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you so much for your uh, two presentations. Um, they were insightful and they fall within one category of uh, cultural uh, mm -hmm. kind of um, uh, misrepresentation and violence and all of these uh, things. And my uh, question goes to Hedia and speaking about Chinua Achebe and things fall apart and about epistemic violence and related the idea to uh, Gayatri Spivax. Can the subaltern speak? Uh, I want to understand what kind of an alternative uh, that Chinua Achebe offers and thinks for a part as an answer to the epistemic violence. Uh, so um, does he just get deeper into the indigenous knowledge and how Africans might answer back, for example, to empire uh, in terms of a tradition and how they could, for example, answer the activities of the missionaries or he kind of brings to the text other possibilities through which the uh, the indigenous Igbo African culture can answer back to the uh, epistemic violence exercised by the British colonial powers. Thank you so much. Thanks for the question. I think uh, he doesn't romanticize pre-colonial Africa either because we see violence in the book um, performed by indigenous people, right? We see domestic violence, for example. Uh, we see the violence of Okonko and his desire for bloodshed. He is uh, he, he's a violent man, he's a wrestler. So Chabi doesn't really romanticize or drawing a perfect picture of indigenous culture, but it's ethnographically 
realistic and it's an alternative to the district commissioner's narrative. So the, the ending of the novel tells us that Achabe's purpose is basically writing a text against misinterpretations. And we know that um, the text is also an answer to Heart of Darkness and the text produced um, by um, British writers and specifically Heart of Darkness. He has got it. Thank you for the answer. No problem. Thank you very much, Hidyoja. Hidyoja, can I uh, ask a question uh, related to the, the epistemic violence? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, uh, we all know uh, that, you know, epistemic uh, violence um, can, to some extent, maybe, uh, can be connected to related to uh, you know um, Foucault's knowledge power relationship. Um, in things fall apart, how uh, do you connect such um, knowledge power uh, relation uh, in terms of epistemic violence? Basically Foucault's ideas, I didn't get deeper into Foucault's ideas, but I just summarized it with one more, one sentence. And I said, for Foucault, pri pri um, privileging some knowledges over others. That's his ideas in his book. Um, and in the book, in, in, in the narrative, we see what knowledge is, pri pri is um, privileged over the indigenous knowledge, right? It's dismissed, uh, it's ignored, it's silenced, and a new set of um, structures, including religious, political, economic, you know, all those new knowledge, set of knowledge, um, or, or the doctor indoctrinations, I should say, replaced the old knowledge, the indigenous knowledge or epistemology, even if it's not, even if it was not um, portrayed um, as perfect. So I think here, what the writer uh, tried to do is to authentically maybe present the indigenous knowledge or the, the African culture. It's not, he's not just reducing it to one, um, one or um, uh, he's basically saying that it's diverse with this tribal conflicts and background. Mm -hmm. That's how we see, I think, uh, knowledge and power relationship in the book in narrative. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Okay, any other question? If you do not have uh, any other question, um, you know, we have uh, other presentations and the, the next one I'm going to chair. Uh, so I'm going to uh, close this session. Okay, thank you very much for joining our session and Hediyojan, thank you very much once more. Um, okay, take.